Welcome. Here we meet again. And admittedly, as the wind blows and the leaves begin to change, it's a bit disappointing that we're not all walking through these doors and worshiping together in the pews. Yet I do believe that even as this, this pandemic season lingers, God is, is present and God is doing something new. I mean, look, we have learned how to worship together even when sitting in different places. And we have heard stories that remind us that God is creating time and time again. Most especially, we have heard stories that remind us that God loves us. So I am glad for us worshiping, whether it is in person or online. And I am glad for this moment where we might worship yet again. Come on in and let's say our prayers today. is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. 
that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Let us say together the Vanity. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Let us say together Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall speak of the might of your wondrous acts and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness they shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to, Tar to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding to steadfast love and ready to relent from, relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, It is right for you to be angry. Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it for the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. 
And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, 
Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Amen. So when I was in Sunday school, here's what I learned about Jonah. He was commanded by God to do something he didn't want to do. So he tried to run away, but he was swallowed by a whale, and God made him stay there for three days until the whale threw him up on the shore. Moral of the story, do what God commands you to do or be swallowed by a whale. Now, from that kind of reading, the story kind of falls apart as we get older because there have been lots of times that I have not done what God has commanded me to do, but I have never, not even one time, been swallowed by the world's largest mammal or even by a large fish like today's translation states. So with that kind of reading, the story sort of becomes one of those Old Testament oddities that it's like, we know that that probably couldn't have happened anyway. And so what is the point of the story for the world that we live in today? It seems irrelevant, it seems a little odd, and we just kind of notice it and move on. But the thing is that Jonah is a really special book in the Bible. For generations, people read the Torah and then the New Testament through many different lenses, many of which we've forgotten about or neglected in our own time. We are absolutely right to approach the Bible with seriousness, but that does not mean that the Bible is meant to be read literally, like a newspaper article reporting some event. I was surprised to learn that Hebrew actually doesn't have vowels, and so the very words themselves are meant to be encountered in a fresh way. They're meant to be living. They're not meant to be static. Some of the Bible is allegory and epic, meant to inspire our holy imaginations. Some of the Bible is legal document, meant to set out rules for living in right relationship with God and with one another. Jesus often spoke in parables, stories that are meant to speak to our hearts and allow us to imagine the kingdom of God in utterly new and surprising ways. And some of the Bible is even humor and satire. So back to the book of Jonah. It's very short, it's only four chapters, and it's full of surprises and some humor and some satire. First, Jonah is called by God, making him a prophet. Now, most prophets, when they're called by God, have incredibly mystical experiences. Isaiah, we're told, has seen God, has seen the Lord being serviced by seraphim with six wings. And he's so overwhelmed by all of this that he cries out in his sin and shame that he's so guilty he can't possibly speak. 
And one of the seraphim takes a coal from the altar on high and brings it to him and touches his lips. And through that, his lips are made clean and he is called by God to speak very difficult words to the nation of Israel. When Jeremiah is called, when the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah, he sees vision of visions of almond trees. He sees boiling water being poured out on the kingdom of the north. It's a very powerful experience. And he says, I'm just a kid. I'm just a boy. You can't send me. And God is like, do not tell me who I can send. I'm sending you. And you better go and stand before the nations. Do not break before them or I will break you. It's this very intense experience. And that's often the way that we encounter these call stories. There is a very intense experience for the prophet. And then the prophet moves on to do difficult and amazing and important work. So when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, instead of being overwhelmed or surprised and submitting and falling to the ground or um, calling out to the Lord for help in carrying out this call that he's been given, Jonah basically runs away. He's like, you want me to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria? That's an enemy land. You want me to go there and tell them that they're being wicked? Uh, no thanks. Jonah out. And he starts to run. And he goes to this ship that's going to basically what would have been the westernmost point of the world as Jonah knew it, Tarshish, in, which is now, in what's now Spain. So you have to imagine that this is actually a pretty expensive trip. He's literally going to the other side of the world to get away from this call. And while he's on this ship, a great storm comes up and the sea is tossing this ship to and fro and the sailors and crew start to ditch their cargo overboard to try to lighten their load but they can't lighten it enough. And so they fall to their knees and begin to pray to their gods. And as they're running around in desperation, they see that Jonah is sleeping and they wake him up and they say, how can you possibly be asleep? There's this huge storm going on. We're praying to our gods, get up and pray to your God and see if your God can make this stop. And immediately Jonah knows what's happening. And he gets up and he says, um, Nothing that you do is going to calm the storm. The storm is my own fault. You have to throw me overboard. And it's fascinating because these pagan sailors and crew members, these people that aren't Hebrew, they aren't praying to the God of Israel. They're actually more just than Jonah. And they say, we won't throw you overboard. That's that's something that we won't do. We don't want that on our hands. And so pray to your God, pray that your God will stop this. And the men start to try to row the ship ashore, but the ship, they can't, they can see the shore, but they can't get there no matter how hard they row. And Jonah says, you guys have to throw me overboard. I'm serious. Like I'm not kidding around. You got to throw me overboard. And so in desperation, the crew finally throws him overboard and the storm immediately calms. And it is at this point when Jonah's in a calm sea that a big fish comes and swallows Jonah up and he has to hang out there for three days and three nights, which sounds revolting. But while he's in the belly of the fish, he starts to pray to God. And he prays in ways that are remarkable and faithful and full of hope. And he prays in thanksgiving for a deliverance that hasn't even happened yet. So Jonah is hanging out in the belly of the fish and God hears his prayer and God causes the fish to spew him onto the shore. So I'm gonna guess that Jonah didn't smell all that great, but clearly he is being given a second chance here. So he's thrown up onto the shore and God says, I've got a call for you. You have to go to Nineveh. And so this time Jonah's like, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> There's no argument this time. 
So Jonah heads to Nineveh, and we're told that Nineveh is a city that's very large. It's actually three days to walk from one side to the other. And as he goes through the city, he calls out, 40, day more, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And as he's walking, remarkably, the people of Assyria believe him. They believe the stranger in their midst that is calling them away from their wickedness, away from the sins they've been committing. They believe a stranger in their midst and they repent and they sit in ashes, they put on sackcloth. The king himself descends from the throne and sits in ashes and calls for a, a nationwide uh, fast that no animal or person shall eat, that everyone shall wear sackcloth. And God sees this and he decides, he turns away from this calamity that he was going to cause. He sees their repentance and he sees their penance and his heart changes. He sees this, he relents, and Jonah is furious. So let's read Jonah's response to this miraculous repentance and conversion of heart. Jonah says, Oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. I knew you're a gracious God and merciful. You're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, oh Lord, please take my life from me for it's better to die than to live. It's ridiculous and whiny and petty. Jonah prayed for God to deliver him while he was in the belly of the fish, but he wants God to withhold deliverance from others. He prayed for God to be merciful to him but he wants to withhold mercy from others. This grown man called by God to be a prophet huffs and puffs and goes outside the city to see what will happen next. Now, as he's sitting outside the city to protect him from the brutal desert sun, God grows a bush over the top of him to give him shade. But the next day God removes it. And Jonas says again, it's better for me to die than to live. But God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry over a bush? And Jonah says, yes, angry enough to die. And the Lord says, you are concerned about a bush. You didn't labor for it. You didn't grow it. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? And just like that, the book of Jonah comes to an end. Now that word concerned, should I not be concerned about Nineveh, might be better translated as take pity. Should God not take pity on an entire people who have repented and turned from their wicked ways? How is it that Jonah asks for God to take pity on him, but wants to keep God from taking pity on others? We see this echoed in our gospel today, where we're told about generosity absolutely beyond our comprehension, where some of the laborers are angry because those who worked least were paid the same as those who worked longest. It's cool and all for the landowner to be generous, but shouldn't he be generous in the way I want him to be? We want God to be merciful and generous and kind, but often we want to put our terms, our restrictions on what that looks like. We want it to make sense to us, but God is not us. God's economy is not our economy. God's generosity and mercy and compassion far exceed anything we can imagine. Jonah can seem so ridiculous 
There are times when I want to scream, you were literally saved from the belly of a fish. Maybe you can relax about God saving the people of Nineveh. But then there are times that I remember I have been just like that. There have been times that I have looked at my own life and the lives of those around me and wondered why God seemed to be more generous with them than with me. There have been times that I have longed for the good things that someone else has rather than being satisfied with the good things that I have. There have been times when envy has utterly eaten away at me. I remember once telling a priest with whom I was working that envy wasn't really an issue for me. I don't really care about material things. That's not my thing. And he smiled and said, sometimes we're not envious of the things people have, but of the life that we imagine that they lead. Oh, I thought, ouch, that really hit close to home. So it turns out that Jonah isn't really about whether it's possible to be partially digested by the world's largest animal and then spewed up on the shore and immediately stand up and have the wherewithal to make a big trip to a foreign city. There is intention behind the stories in the Hebrew Bible. So much of that intention is to call us to remember who we are and who God is. And so it is with Jonah. Remember, remember that when God calls, running is fruitless. Remember, remember that God shows mercy to those we think deserve it and those we think don't deserve it. Remember, remember that God has shown mercy and compassion and generosity to me and to you. Remember, Remember that we ought not envy our sisters and brothers when God shows mercy and compassion and generosity to them. And if a story about a guy who ends up in the funky digestive tract of a big fish helps you remember, the story has done its work. Amen. Would you please join me in saying these words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope and we shall never hope in vain. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, 
for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For those in our armed forces. We pray especially for Chip Barton, Joey Barton, David Ryan, Jordan Warner, Zachariah Hoyditch, Jack Norris, Charlie Babb, Andrew Mettler, Trav DeGroot, Doug, Scott Marcus, Jordan Jimenez, Chris Peters, Antoli Impagliazzo, Jason Eaton, Kyle Talbot, Chris Dwyer, Austin Jackson, Steve Miozzi, Danny Hayden, Gregory Durant, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Nicholas, our bishop, for all bishops and other ministers, and for the clergy and lay staff of our parish. We join with communities throughout the diocese and pray for the people and clergy of St. Matthew's and Mark Barrington and St. Matthew's Jamestown, for all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we pray especially for Margaret Poole, Julian, Braden Mossy, Larry Baxter, Steve, Leo, Donna Omanoff, Nancy Sachuk, Jackie Hudson, John Grimley, Katerina Ruda, Jim T, Sam Hopp, David Rodriguez, Samantha Mossy, Samantha Simus, Roz, Mike Birmingham, Liz McClintock, Larry Weijen, Michael Torrey, and Susan Davis. You may add your own petitions. And during this time of global pandemic, we pray God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid, or in isolation. In their loneliness, be their consolation. In their anxiety, be their hope. In their darkness, be their light. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. You may add your own thanksgivings. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. You may add your own petitions. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please join me in reciting this prayer attributed to St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. 
For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. So much for joining us for worship today and a particular welcome to those of you who have perhaps found us online for the very first time. I'm so glad that you found us. If you'd like to introduce yourself to me or ask any questions about St. Luke's, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email address is trich at stlukeseg.org. I hope to hear from you and I hope even more to meet you face to face someday soon. Let me tell you about some things that are happening here at St. Luke's. First of all, tonight at five o'clock, we will have our social hour time. The invitation to that by way of Zoom is in the weekly constant contact that goes out. So I hope you'll join us this evening. 
I also want to let you know that um, we've changed our worship rhythm a little bit in terms of the location of our worship. Now, both the 745 and the 1015 services will be held in the sanctuary week after week after week. No more flip-flopping around. We have discovered a way to make sure that the sanctuary is clean in between those two services so that everyone will be kept safe. So just do keep that in mind as you make plans to join us for worship. Finally, as you make plans for the future, if you know or even have a child, know that we are working hard to open up our Sunday school offering. We um, have discussed ways that we might do it in person as long as we can be outside and as long as the, um, as the numbers are safe here as kids go back to school elsewhere. So stay tuned for further information about that. But mark, at least in pencil, Mark on your calendar October 11th as the Sunday when, um, when we'll be offering uh, Sunday school again for our youth. One final thing to mark on your calendar, and that is on October 4th, we will be doing the blessing of the animals as that is also the day that we remember St. Francis. And so animals are invited to come for worship and um, to stick around for a blessing afterwards. Um, that will take place, the blessing, at 11 o'clock. So if you wanna just come with your animal at 11, then that's fine too. But October 4th, we will be blessing all animals from dogs, cats, birds, snakes, yes, even snakes, chickens and rabbits and anything you can bring, we'll bless. So again, thank you so much for joining us for worship. I hope this day finds you and your loved ones well. And may God bless you.